Hi everyone, my name is Filippo Nassetti and I'm going to teach the Live Academy Grasshopper Intermediate class named Karst Eroded Morphologies. Some of you may know me from semester one, where I taught a class on fibrous morphologies named Superabundance. This time we're going to do something different along the lines of what you see in the image. Just a quick recap about myself. I work at Zaha Hadid Design, which is the company of the Zaha Group that focuses on uh, product design and small scale installation and artworks. I teach at UCL the Bartlett in the BPRO program, and I co-founded a design research collaborative named MOX with Alessandro Zomparelli, who is also teaching here at Live Academy. So um, the, what we're going to do now is something different than what we did before. Uh, I'm pretty excited for that. And that's something that stems out of a fascination of mine uh, with eroded morphologies. So uh, I've been interested for a few years now uh, in the patterns that emerge wherever erosion takes place, how wind and water can carve the rock and transform it, and how certain patterns may emerge the complexity of such formations. These images were shot in the Philippines a few years ago. And uh, yeah, that's something that you can find pretty much around the world. It varies a lot from place to place. It generally is characterized by this complexity. And specifically in the last year, I became interested with a very specific type of eroded morphology named karst. So karst is a limestone Morphology, uh, it's being eroded by water and uh, it's characterized by this very uh, distinctive appearance where you can see that there are elongated spikes coming out uh, of the ground and uh, uh, creating topography. So karst formation can extend, can extend themselves for quite wide uh, ranges uh, of, uh, of space. So it becomes a topography that you can navigate and is very distinctive for the shape on the individual elements. So as it was for the case of the fibers, I'm interested in general in the idea of tissues or aggregations or systems where it's not pretty much about the individual elements, but how many things can come together and form uh, a, an aggregation and how patterns can emerge out of that. So I was interested in the karst morphology specifically because uh, it reminds me somehow on the work of certain type of artwork like uh, the research of Malevich and the suprematism. So these are models from Malevich. And, and as you can see, there is, it's different, of course, but at the same time, there is this ele these elongated elements coming together, aggregating, and how different uh, elements can, can form uh, an aggregation and the pattern can emerge. Clearly, this is something different than what we saw before but somehow there is a similarity of a visual space that is intriguing me. And I was also intrigued to see how can a connection can be met, can be created between these two. Suprematism is also the root of the work of Zaha, that uh, the work of Malevich, from whom the work of Malevich was a main uh, source. And so I started experimenting a bit in this space. As I mentioned before, it's not that the, you put together references that are exactly the same, but rather this creates a visual space and there is a tension between the different elements of similarities and differences, which was interesting to explore. So I began by working with generative algorithms. Uh, these are generative algorithms which are working with images, processing images, rearranging the distribution of pixels and starting to create aggregations where again, I was intrigued by the fact that in this case, there was something that was retaining features of the geological space, but at the same time being very clearly uh, digital. Uh, and also was intrigued by the fact that uh, the whole thing is produced at the generative level as a purely 2D space, but in fact, it retains some kind of depth. So it's a kind of post-natural case, uh, a digital case, so to speak. And uh, so the I started producing a set of images in this sense, trying to start inquiring the space and see what can be produced. And news of the day, and which may be most interesting for you guys, is that I developed a workflow 
that allow us to turn those shapes into three-dimensional aggregations and the workflow is completely integrated within Rhino and Grasshopper and that's going to be the focus of the uh, Grasshopper class I'm going to teach in, in semester two. So as you can see, uh, there are many elements uh, which can be regarded as simple, so we can identify them as boxes or cubes, elongated cubes, of course, hyperstretch cubes that come together in a complex aggregation and patterns are emerging out of that and deliver an image which is uh, which retains something of a, a geography, of a, a geology, of a topography, so to speak. So to speak. And this is something that can relate to patterns, but also can relate to objects which are defined in space and enclosed. So these are all images renderings done uh, of objects that generated with the workflow that we're going to work with. As you can see, there are simple elements being distributed according to complex organizations instead and complex patterns. And uh, um, and yeah, by changing the two, we can, I believe that the visual space that can be explored, the design space that can be explored is pretty wide in that sense. You can see that the FX can vary quite a bit and the exploration of that will be the focus of the class uh, in semester two at Live Academy. So now let's have a quick look into how things look into Rhino Grasshopper. Uh, you can see that it's visualized in the Rhino viewport karst aggregation, so to speak. Um, they are simple elements, as you can see, they are plain boxes um, aggregated according to patterns. The density and shape uh, of the units can be changed. Let's have a look at how we can change the density, for instance, by simply adapt, adjusting certain parameters. So we can have something which works with different resolutions. So now I'm working at lower resolution than before. It can go in both direction. Uh, also the extension of these units can be changed. If we want to have something more elongated, for instance, and we can get something like that. That's something which is quite distinctive. Potentially the look is different, like the fact that we have one side which is uh, uh, defined by these very clean lines. And then it shows a section in a way with high level of articulation. You can even increase with higher resolution. Alternatively, we can go the other, completely on the other way and reduce like the extension of these elements. And then we start having something like more like a cloud of boxes, which may be another effect especially if we increase the resolution, then it may become more interested in order to have more elements in space. That may be another effect. Uh, we will see how to change also, because maybe we don't want to have boxes, but we want to have different shapes. That's something that we can look into. And um, an interesting thing is that, uh, which I want to, to stress is that in the first part of the class, we're going to focus uh, on to how the cloud uh, morphology and aggregation can be generated and controlled as an object. While in the second part of the class, we will focus on how to animate it. So for instance, uh, animations like, you know, the train is not exactly a software for animation, neither Grasshopper, but at the same time, uh, there is the possibility to animate sliders and to link behaviors of object to sliders. And that's a quick, an easy way to animate parametric objects and to play around a bit. Um, and I think there are a few options for that. So the video that you saw at the beginning and you're gonna see at the end was done uh, through a grasshopper animation, uh, which I have here. So let's have a quick look at that. So let's go back to the parameters that we had before. So more extended boxes. And then uh, if I change the slider, for instance, I will see that the units start to stretch and the aggregation become more messy in a way. So more elongated line moving around and this uh, uh, changes to an extreme. And something very elongated in space. Um, that's something this slider can be animated. So you don't need to go through with moving the cursor, but they can animate it. It automatically will produce 
the, the animation frames. So the animation would be, if you remember, the idea was to have something moving from uh, like a cloud of uh, a stretch boxes in space, a cloud of stretch pixels in space, or stretch boxes in space, like uh, uh, transforming itself, uh, moving from a condition of total instability to a condition which is more stable, where there is still movement, but around uh, uh, a more defined pattern and shape. We can see that it's uh, uh, being formed. Uh, I'm keeping a low resolution now because uh, uh, otherwise it would take some time to calculate each step and the video would be super slow. But clearly this uh, can be, uh, the resolution can be increased, the subdivision can be increased, the number of boxes can be increased and obtain a video which has a very high resolution and a very high level of detail. Uh, it's not only about uh, uh, the geometry, but it's also about uh, um, the cameras. So there is one of the plugins which I asked you to install, which is named Horster, which is Horster Camera Control. It's a plugin that allows you to uh, control the cameras. So you can get the cameras, you can animate the cameras. And then we may see, let me activate it. Then once we set up that part of the definition, also the camera will start to move with your animation. So you can see that slightly it's turning, it's moving, and then it's going uh, in front of you. So if you remember the animation, which I'm gonna play again at the end, but uh, it's basically a high resolution version of what we see now. Like there was the idea of having this cloud of elements floating and the condition of total instability. And then suddenly the camera starts to turn and you realize that it's not a 2D shape anymore, but it's, uh, it's actually a 3D shape. And then these units are shrinking and uh, uh, clustering themselves around a more organized and clear pattern. So uh, that's what we're going to work with. Um, we will build the, the code step by step. We will see how we can control this distribution of elements. We will use displacement and scattering maps. We will see how to treat such maps, how then different elements can be aggregated, how we can tweak the parameters to produce different results. As you can see, this is a type of effect, but already if I move on the other side, I get something which is quite different. So, I believe that there is quite a bit of space to play around with and produce a very different type of uh, uh, aggregations and images. You see that's already quite different as an effect and so on. And then while in the first part we will focus on aggregation, then the second part will be animation tools. So we'll see how to animate bo both the animation, both the morphology itself and the camera and potentially even more. So uh, I'm pretty excited. It's something uh, which uh, uh, I, I developed uh, in the last few months. So it's also one of the first time I'm teaching it. It's pretty fresh and I'm excited to go ahead and see you on the day of the class. Thank you for your attention.